Hey, what's up, Unbroken Nation? Hope that you're doing well wherever you are in the world today. I'm very excited to be back with you with another episode with my friend, social entrepreneur, James Connor. James, my friend, how are you? What is happening in your world today? Hey, man, Michael, I am so happy to be here. It's great talking with you, and I look forward to, to this time with you and just, you know, telling my story and learning more about you and then, you know, I, teaching people hopefully about the things that I've done. Yeah, man, I'm super excited. You and I connected a few months ago and I loved your story. I loved your journey. And so for those who do not know you, tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are today. Yeah. So I, I want to say my story started, you know, back uh, in high school, uh, you know, I met, you know, as I was growing up, I didn't know a whole bunch of people and that wasn't very popular with the girls. Uh, but then something happened when I was in high school and it just changed. Right. So then I met someone, fell in love. And what that led to was, uh, by the time I was 24, I actually had four children. So for me, it was a matter of, I fell in love with this woman. Uh, I was introduced to this group of people and it wasn't necessarily the best crowd for me. Right. It wasn't necessarily. Not that I needed to be around with, with these people that were all very highly successful, had money or anything like that. But these, you know, we were, we were drinking a lot. We were, you know, smoking, we were doing all this stuff, you know, in my 20s, 19s and 20s. Uh, but then I was also having these kids with this woman. So uh, I was kind of digging myself a hole. And what I ultimately had to do is I had to just dig myself out uh, and, you know, pull up my big boy pants take care of my family, go to school full time, work full time, multiple jobs, and just figure it out and, and grow up. Because then uh, I looked up and I sat there and I said, okay, I'm going to end up 35, 40 years old, and I'm going to be in the same spot. You know, and I just decided that's not what I wanted. So I, I said, okay, what do I need to do? I, I put out some, um, I, I put out some feelers for some people that I said, Hey, look, how can I turn around? What do I need to do? Give me some guidance. And, uh, those, that's one of the reasons I work with nonprofits today is because there were some nonprofit founders that just kind of pulled me in and said, Hey, you know, get it together, try this, do that. And, you know, start helping people. And then as I helped people, I started growing up so fast. It was just like, wow. Like I complained about a lot of things and, and I just didn't take, uh, take what I had, uh, to the point where I, it was to the point where I just took things for granted. Right. You just, I mean, you do, right. You don't, until you see other things that happen in other people's lives, it is just a matter. It's just eye open. Yeah. I, I think that's so true for a lot of us. We take, I mean, I, I can go and trace so much of my life and just taking little things for granted, but you know, I, I think that's unfortunately a part of the journey. Um, when, when you talk about the work that you've done for people, why did that matter? Like, how did that play such a big role in your life? Well, one of the things that, that, uh, happened was as I was going to school, uh, I was looking for different ways of making money, right? Looking, looking for jobs. One of the things I did was I became an EMT. Uh, so then I was out, you know, in, in the ambulance working with, working with other, um, technicians, you know, trying to help save lives. And you will go to some of the most, uh, terrible neighborhoods and realize like, Hey, you know, there are others that have it worse than I do. Uh, and those were kind of neighborhoods that we went into because, you know, uh, at that time, the place that I lived in the, in the uh, neighborhood that I was at the community, it wasn't like, you know, a rich or, or even a middle-class community, it was lower class community, but it, I felt like, you know, it was a good opportunity for me to get to know people, give back to my community. Plus learn uh, a lot about, you know, healthcare, medicine, those kind of things, because that's at the time, that's what I was going to college for. Uh, I was a pre-med, but then I ended up, I actually ended up going to, uh, take a computer science class and, and just going into the tech world. And now I, I help out nonprofits and startup founders with, you know, their tech needs. So, uh, I've been able to be able to do that and now travel the world as a digital nomad working on all these different projects, working for different companies as a developer and, and helping nonprofits, you know, reach their goals and mission because they are not, you know, tech friendly. So, but that allows me to continue helping people as I did all those years back. 
Yeah. One of the things I, I always remember early on in my journey is hearing and really sitting in this idea of like, if you're at your lowest, go and serve, like go and be of service, go and help people. And, and that's a huge part of like what this show is. I'm like, you know, if we can come together and help people, even if it's in this digital space, like that's so much more than, than I've ever had access to do right now. That does include volunteering and things of that nature, but ultimately it's through this avenue where I'm like, this matters. Right. But I, I, I think like a lot of people are disillusioned by how much it matters when, when you were starting to go through, I, I mean, look, life must've been very chaotic for you, right. To, to be that young four kids. I don't, I can't even imagine dude. Right. And so like you got four kids, you, you're trying to go to school, you're working this full-time job. What was there like a rock bottom moment in this? Was there just like a, like, oh my God, if I don't like what became the precursor to the change that ultimately has become your life? So when I had my, when we had our, our second uh, child, so I had my son and then I had my oldest daughter, I had to make a decision. Like it was a very hard decision. And I give credit to uh, the, the, the mother of my ch children. She actually said, no, there's no way you're dropping out of school because I, I really, really had to think hard about that. Right. Mm -hmm. Cause for me, my stress level was way up there. Just, I mean, we just with the two kids and it was just a matter of saying, Hey, look, I might have to drop out of school or go part-time and, you know, figure it out and get, you know, we need money. You know, like one of the things, one of the memories I had, uh, was I, I had to go inside the bank to withdraw $7 because I couldn't do it by ATM card. I had to go to the bank teller, fill out a slip, $7 to, so I can go buy diapers. And for me, that's why I was like, this has got to stop. I got to change. Like this is, I, I can't keep doing this. Um, so if that was rock bottom, you know, it was there. Granted, I had two more children after that. But by that time I was actually on the road back. We were happy. We were, um, you know, life was getting good, but I was actually getting close to graduating. I had people actually saying, Jim, we want you to do an internship with our company. Things were looking up because, uh, I was keeping myself busy. You know, it wasn't, that was the other thing. So those people that are hanging out with, you know, like sometimes we were like, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I knew I was going to be drinking. You know, I, I became, uh, I was a bartender when I was 21 and I, you know, just started hanging out with that, that group of people. And. Uh, it was fun. Definitely loved the, that, that time of year, but a uh, time in my life. But, uh, when I became an EMT and I started working for other, uh, organizations that needed, uh, tech support, it kept me out of that environment. I could then just sit there and concentrate and focus on, okay, how can I get better at this job? How can I get better skills? How can I learn more and continue to grow? And then also I started thinking more about the kids because they were getting older, right? It wasn't just so much now. Now they were walking. Now they, they were more fun, uh, things like that. And they needed more of my attention. It wasn't just like, okay, just give them a bottle, put them to sleep, you know, those kind of things. So as the kids were growing up uh, and I was 23, I really started sitting there thinking like, all right, we're making progress, but we still had a long road to go to. Yeah. And I think progress is like, this really interesting dichotomy, right? At least in my experience, because on the one hand, you're like, I'm moving forward. And then on the other hand, you're like, am I actually moving forward? And it's this really weird thing because you, you know, how do you see the forest for the trees? And mm -hmm. I've certainly had those moments, man, where I, I'll never forget this. I went and I overdrafted my bank account on a pack of gum. And I'm like, that was a $35 pack of gum. Right. Yep. And to this day, it's probably the most expensive thing I've ever paid for in my life. And, you know, you think about those moments and, you know, they, they kind of build you like, even right. though they're difficult and they're hard and they're uncomfortable. Cause I, I remember having to tell my roommate and I was 19 at the time, I hadn't really started figuring out success yet. And I was like, dude, um, I can't really pay you rent until next week because I just bought a pack of gum. And he's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> And, and that's a part of the journey. And it's a part of life as you've progressed and you're looking at life now, when, when you look back 
on those moments, like, is there a reconciliation for you? Do you look at those and go, man, these are great lessons? Because I think a lot of people tend to, you know, kind of beat themselves up about that. They go, oh man, I wasted all this time. I did this, I did that. But you said something really interesting that, that caught my ear. You said, like, I enjoyed that time of life. And, and I think that maybe that's just a part of the evolution of the human experience. Right. Well, for me, uh, as part of my personality is trying to live in the present, you know, uh, enjoying the time that I have at that time, it was being a bartender in a nightclub at 22 years old, uh, you know, hanging out, meeting different people. It, it was fun, right? I'm not even going to sugarcoat it. It was, it was a good time. Um, it just wasn't a, it's not an environment I wanted to stay in long-term, mm. but it, it definitely being in different environments helps you grow. It puts you in a different comfort zone, you know, and at the same time, you can't always be, and I, I do it to today. You can't always be just business, 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 business. You know, you've got to have some fun. You've got to keep it loose and things like that. But, you know, it is all part of the growth. Those things that you go through, just like you said, it's all going to kind of mold who you are. Um, but at the same time, I don't necessarily look back and say, uh, I regret having four kids, love my kids, do as much as I can for them. Love, love the fact that they're old enough now. Like my son is going to be 26 next month and we're going to go hang out. We're going to go on a trip or, you know, he's going to come visit me. Uh, and you know, we're, we're going to have some fun, but so I love my kids. It's just you, I look back and I tell them it's almost one of those things. I'm like, don't have any kids, not until you're ready. Like I'm like drilling it into them all the time because I know how hard it was. And I'm like, don't do it to yourselves. It was, I love you guys, but it was hard. And, you know, they just, they know that. So now they, they listen and they're just like, yeah, okay, dad. Yeah. We remember you did this. And I, I tell them I'm right wide. I'm open. Like, Hey, there were times where I was struggling to get gas money to take us home, you know, and that was the struggle. And I sit there and say, I don't want you guys to struggle like that. I'm, you know, this is what you guys should do. Let's, let's talk, let's plan it out and then keep yourself out of trouble. I'm not saying it's gotta be just all business and no fun. I want them to have fun. I want them to enjoy life. I want them to grow and make, make, uh, make their own mistakes. But at the same time, I'm like drilling into them, like keep your eye on the prize and don't let, don't, don't add boulders. I told them, Hey, life is like going up a hill with a boulder strapped to your back. You know, with each mistake, you're adding another boulder. So like, with each, I was like, imagine me going up a hill with like six boulders because I have four kids at the time. That's exactly what it was like. What you mentioned the word struggle. What did you learn about yourself through struggle, especially during that time? And even today, like, like, what do you learn about? What do you understand? What was maybe the most valuable lesson for you in struggle? Uh, for me, the most valuable part is the fact that I, I could be a mental, it, it strengthens you mentally, you know, for mm -hmm. that struggle does that, does do that. So like I tell people that, that wor working out isn't necessarily for me to, to keep my weight down and, and be strong and be fit and look good at the beach. Uh, that is all, you know, a, a consequence of everything. That's great. But for me, it's a mental, mental thing. Like if I'm saying, all right, I'm going to do 10 laps around this track. Okay. I want to get those 10 laps. I don't want to give up. I don't want to stop at eight. And the reason I am able to continue doing that is because of the struggles that I went through that I didn't give up. I, I didn't just sit there and say, you know, this is hard. Like I need to, I, I just want to give up. I just want to, I just want to walk away. You know, I want to go have fun. I don't, I don't want all this responsibility. Uh, at the same time, those struggles taught me, look in the mirror. You did this. You can't blame anyone. So it's not like, uh, I, I, I talk to a lot of people now, uh, especially some youth, uh, high school students, and they say, hey, we don't have the opportunities. Man, there's no, you know, there's nobody, you know, giving us, you know, we have stimulus checks and stuff like that, but you know, th there's no jobs out there for, for black people like me, like, no, 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 uh, -uh. there's no excuses. You know, we got to go ahead and, and, and make the best of what our opportunity is. There's going to be some unfair advantage advantages towards us. Okay. But we got to deal with it. We got to pull our big boy pants on and then go out there and figure out a way to get a, you know, to, to make it work and do the best that we can, because for me, that's what the struggle did is just to sit there and say, I can't blame anyone. Let's get through this. Let's figure it out. And then go from there. Because at the end of the day, you're, you're struggling. It's, 
it, it can be lonely, but the other part of it is there are people out there to help out. That's what nonprofits are out there for. That's what some of these government programs are there for is because there are people that want to help you have a better life. You just have to be courageous enough to let them know I could use some help. Yeah, that's a, a really strong point. A, a lot of people want to give up when things get hard, you know, because it's easy. Like, like really, let's call it what it is. It's easy to give up when life is difficult, when your back's against the wall, when you got $7, you know, for diapers to your name, when everything seems to be tumultuous and exhausting. And, and here's what's really interesting. I think that whether you are rich or you're poor or you're in between, whether you grew up in, you know, a great home or a poor home or whatever your race may be, like there's struggle in this thing. Mm -hmm. Like, it for everybody. And, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I didn't wake up with a roadmap in my hand that said, this is the way that you live. It's like, dude, I got to go out here and figure this out every day. And there's days where I don't want to, but you, you know, just like you in the laps, it's, it's, I have drilled within myself, this idea that you have to keep going forward no matter what, but, but people want to quit because it's, it's hard. James, what would you tell to people? when they want to quit? Like, like what advice would you give them when they're in that place? Cause you've been there, I've been there. Yeah. And it's like, it's really easy to say, don't give up. But you know, I don't think that really helps that much for people who are at their, sure. just at their lowest, you know? Mm -hmm. I would say the same thing I tell my kids. I was like, it's life is hard. Uh, you know, I know you want to give up, but just continue, just keep going just a little bit longer. You know, whether you say, okay, I'm going to give this another day. I'm going to give it another week. I'm going to give it another month. Just set a deadline and just keep going. Uh, and then once you get to that deadline, see if there was any progress. See if, if, if things got easier. See if you stuck to your plan. Because at the end of the day, if you could sit there and make a little bit of progress, improve by that 1% or, or get a little bit closer to out of the hole or closer to your goal, if you see that little progress, it will motivate you to say, all right, okay, all right, I didn't give up when I, when I could have, and okay, maybe that'll motivate them to keep going. Maybe they'll, they'll say, all right, I'll give it another week. I'll give it another month. So it's not that don't give up. I'm just saying like, just try a little bit longer, you know, just give it, just be patient, you know, just give it a, a more, you know, just focus a little bit more and see what happens. I mean. There are times where I sit there as a startup founder and I'm like, you've been working on this project for two years. Like, whoa, that's a long time. Like, you know, I'm like, mm, what's your, you know, how far have you gotten? You know, what's the progress been and things like that. If the metrics aren't there, I'm like, it's probably time to pivot or try to something, try something else. It's not always saying you need to go in that straight path and keep going. There's going to be times where you got to make a left turn and then good, then go straight again. You know, like, it's just a matter of being patient and then figuring out, all right, maybe I should try something different. Maybe I need to do, uh, maybe find an alternative to get to the same point. It's not always just one line. There's always, there's, there's definitely different ways to get to the same destination. Yeah, there totally is. And I think that that's one of the things that I hope people will really take away from just life is like, yo, you can still get there, but it might take you 37 different attempts, right? It might take you 112 attempts. I don't know if this is true or not, but you hear that thing where it's like, you know, Colonel Sanders who made Kentucky fried chicken, he got declined like a thousand times before anyone like ever bought his recipe. Mm -hmm. And you're kind of like, I don't know if it was really a thousand, you know, it might be an old wives tell, but like, there's right. something to that. Right. Cause when you think about that, you're like, oh yeah, that, that guy put in the effort, he put in the work. He was like, I'm going to be resilient and keep going forward. You, you mentioned about that you know, there is help out there that especially in the nonprofit world, there are people, there are organizations that want to help you that are actually literally built for that purpose. I would love for you to just kind of give us first and foremost, an overview and talk about what a nonprofit really is and the way that they operate in the world. Well, a nonprofit is usually could be, uh, you know, a team of people, but it's an, it's an, organization that has said, we're going to provide a service and assistance to those people, uh, to their audience and their, it could be customers. There are nonprofits where I started a nonprofit, uh, our nonprofit flexible sites. 
it it's a nonprofit that helps nonprofits and startup founders, you know, with their tech tech needs. So if they need a website, if they need data analysis, they need something like that. But so we have actual customers, um, but we're still a nonprofit because we're not looking to make, you know, 10, $20 million off of our projects. We're just looking to provide those people with, uh, the opportunity to find tech support, people that can help provide them with an idea of what their, their tech needs are and, and help them with those needs, you know, without breaking the bank within their budget. So a lot of these organizations are out there. They're looking to support other people. Okay. So if I'm, if when I was growing up, one of the nonprofits at, at some point we had a, uh, we were on welfare. So we were in section eight housing. So that's a government program that we were able to stay in. Uh, it was a way for me to be able to afford us having the kids and, 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 uh, having a home without, you know, if I really, if we didn't have section eight, I definitely wouldn't have been able to go to college. You know, I would have had to go work multiple jobs, things like that. So, but you know, so that's a government program, but then we also had nonprofits where they would sit there and they would provide, you know, uh, clothing for the kids. They knew, they said, Hey, you're in college, you're working jobs, you know, and then they would do a run a campaign and say, okay, you know, we're collecting kids clothes. And they were just dropped by with a bag of clothes and say, what do you want? You know? So it was those kind of programs and organizations that were, were like, whoa, thank you so much. And these other people like, didn't even know who they were. You know, these are the kind of people I remember working at a, a, a gas station and it had one of those convenience stores in the middle of it and, and, and working late at night. I had to work on a Thanksgiving. I had two people bring me a plate of food just because they said, Jim, you've been always so nice to me. Every time you come, we come in, you greet us nice. You, you, you know, and the one lady, I had no idea who she was, but she said, Jim, you've talked to me a couple of times and, and, and helped me out. And I said, I have no idea who you are, but thank you for the plate. You know, like it was great. I mean, and these are the type of people that just do things, you know, out of the goodness of their heart. And these are the type of not every nonprofit is a goodwill nonprofit. You know, there's some that are just, you know, they're, they're, uh, using the system to, to make money, but a majority of nonprofits are out there to support you, to, to help those people that need the support because without nonprofits, when I was young, I wouldn't be here where I am today. Yeah. That's powerful, man. It makes me think of, you know, also growing up and being a kid, section eight WIC food stamps, um, government subsidies for everything, food pantries. I mean, all that stuff is probably the only reason that, you know, life wasn't worse than it was. I mean, sure. definitely childhood wasn't great for me, but, you know, those things certainly helped. You know, I, I think it's really interesting when people hear things like nonprofit and in this society, and I don't want to label people and generalize, but I'm going to for the sake of what I need to ask because I think it's mm -hmm. important because somebody listening right now is keeping themselves away from my opportunity due to pride, due to ego. And, and I would love for you to talk about that because I think that there are so many of these systems that are in place that are here to help people. And, and a lot of people are afraid to just step aside from their ego and say, you know what? I do need help. Hey, what's up on Broken Nation? We'll be right back to today's episode, but I want to take a moment and invite you to Think Unbroken Conference. That's right. Our next conference is happening right around the corner this December with amazing speakers from around the world who are leaders in personal development, trauma education, mindset, and more. All you have to do to register to watch for free, that's right, zero dollars, come and join us, is go to myunbrokenlife.com, register and sign up. You can get access to the free event. Watch it live with us this December. It'll be myself speaking along with amazing human beings like Anthony Trucks, Jamie Bronstein, Leslie Logan, and a special interview that I'm doing with Dr. Gabor Mate that has never before been released. So come and join us, myunbrokenlife.com. All you have to do is put in your email. We'll send you over the registration. You'll be able to come and join us, watch live. And then if you want access to the recordings or more information there for you to keep them forever. But in the meantime, go sign up up, block it off on your calendar. This is going to be a transformational experience that you do not want to miss. Head over to myunbrokenlife.com to register for free. Until next time, be unbroken. There is, unfortunately, I've talked to some uh, women and they won't get WIC. You know, they won't do the paperwork that they need to do or, you know, do all the things that they need for WIC. Uh, and they don't want to accept it, you know. 
uh it's just because they just they feel like no i don't i don't need that i don't need help i'm good and i'm like it's there it's for it's it this is the reason it's it's there for you because you are within the you know the salary range so but there are a lot of people that they just though they figure hey i can do it myself i'm smart enough you know if they some people say if i go and ask for help that means i'm admitting i'm stupid or i'm lazy you know and i'm like that's not the case if you are are trying your, your darndest to get out there and do whatever you need to do to reach your goal and somebody comes along and says ah oh, okay I'll give you a help. I'll give you a ride. Why not take it? Why be so, oh, no, no, no. I'll walk the 20 miles there. I don't need a ride. Thank you very much. Like, I don't understand it. But at the same time, you know, with my, my upbringing and everything, pride definitely came in, did not come into thinking as I had these four kids. Did I have, there was times where I sat there and said, you know, that, you know, I don't need to go do this and I don't need to go that, do that. More so because it was the fact that I had my kids. I was sitting there like, no, I don't need to put myself in that position uh, where I'm in debt to someone. But with a nonprofit, it's not that way. You're not in debt. You're not sitting there going for a loan or something of that nature and have to pay it back. These people are just donating things, you know, and it's, and it's a help from the masses. The nonprofits are a gateway to, you know, mass audience and say, hey, look, we're looking to help these people. If you have an extra coat or if you have some some toys that are laying around the house that you're not using or anything that your kids have outgrown, donate it so that, you know, these people that uh, can't can't afford it during Christmas is great. Because for me, Toys for Tots is a great nonprofit. Every Christmas, I go out and buy a little bike and then put it in that truck and then call it a day. I don't need any accolades. I don't need anybody to, to, to say, Hey, Jim, you know, thank you. I don't need to promote it anywhere. I just want to do that because I know that how hard it was during Christmas when I could not, you know, I was sitting there struggling enough to pay bills and groceries. Now you got to think about Christmas and presents. Like, you know, that time is, is highly stressful. So I knew, I remember how that felt. So now I go and do toys for tots every time I get a chance. Yeah. And there's one of the things I think is so, and, and I had the sigh because I remember being young and looking at the conversation around people who needed support being they're lazy, they're good for nothing. They're, you know, on the back of the government, they're not helping. And I'm like, people don't fucking understand how hard it can be. Right. I think those people who say those kind of things have never been in that situation. And, and that's big reason why I want to have you on the show to talk about this is to like take off this stigma that asking for help is like this, this shock to the system in which you're a bad person. Like, I really feel like that's a big part of the conversation, James, where people hear they're like, you know, I, I needed assistance and people just cast judgment, dude. I'm like, why don't like, we are a community. Here's what's so fascinating to me. If you think about this for a second, we are a communal species. Just mm -hmm. we are. We need each mm -hmm. other. We need to support each other. We need to come around the campfire and share the spoils of the day's hunt so we can thrive. And yet mm -hmm. there's there's people who just will go, you're just on the back of the government. I'm like, I don't, I don't think that's true. And I think right. more so a lot of these systems have been put in a place. So people like you, for instance, people like me can find the resources and the tools that they need to be successful. Do you find that it's true that like the vast majority of people who are needing this kind of help are like seeking a handout? No, I mean, there are some people like, you know, I hear people talk, especially in, in some of the communities I used to hang out with. Uh, where they would be like, man, I just want to get a check, you know, just give me a check every month and I can just, you know, just hang out and play video games and stuff. So there are, there are people like, you know, but I would love to do that. Right. If there was a check coming in every month <laughs> and I could just do whatever. Sure. I, I'm not going to lie. That's exactly what the kind of life I would like. But at the same time, there are plenty of people that are just in a situation and it's not their fault. My situation where I had the kids. I, I look in the mirror and it's, there's no one else to blame. Right. But at the same time, I was still a young kid. You know, I made my mistakes. I sat there and I said, okay, I got myself back on the right path 
but I needed assistance. I needed support and I needed uh, people to, to guide me, to put me on that path. So for me, it's a matter of what do you do with the opportunity or what do you do with that support? That's the kind of person that will kind of, you know, define, you know, define who you are when you sit there and look back, okay, you got assistance and you're still in the same spot. Maybe it didn't work out. Maybe there's some other issues, but if you're still in the same spot, then, you know, maybe you have to look at yourself and say, I need to change. There's something you have to do. So it's not just always pride though. So I, I don't want to make it seem like some people are just like, no, 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 I'm too good for that. And things like that. Some people, I remember my mom was on food stamps when we were young and we went to a grocery store and back then they had the food stamps that looked like monopoly money, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like the day with yeah. the debit card and you just swipe the debit card. So they don't know if it's a debit card or if it's a food stamp card, but, uh, yeah, so it would look like monopoly money. So my mom was there and then she would have to take that money out and in, in front of other people and like advertise, yeah, we're on food stamps, we're poor. And she was so embarrassed doing that. Every time she would like move her body so she can give it without people seeing it. Uh, so it's not, sometimes it's not just about pride. It's about, they don't want to be embarrassed. They don't want to feel, be looked down upon. And that I think is more of a hindrance than the, the, than the pride thing is to be able to, to provide help and support without someone thinking like they're being judged, you know? And that's kind of one of the things like if I, if, if I'm not doing well, and there's a, uh, you know, I'm, I'm struggling to get, uh, groceries. You don't want to go wait in line in a food pantry. A lot of food pantries now, they don't have a line that's outside. So where people can see you publicly, they want a waiting room inside a building so that people can go in there and not be seen, you know, that, you know, that they're at the food pantry. That's one of the, one of the food pantries I work with in uh, Camden, New Jersey, they were doing, having so many people that they couldn't afford. Uh, they didn't have a space big enough to keep people from being outside. So at some point, you know, just people would, would drive up, see that there's a line and then just keep going, even though they needed these groceries and, and this free food. So it was just a matter of, they just did not want to be seen as, you know, to, to, to be identified as yeah, poor. Yeah. That, that actually makes a lot of sense because you just painted the exact picture of what I felt like as a kid to be in those situations of just feeling embarrassment and shame and guilt. And part of me being like, I will never, ever put myself in that situation because you would just hear the rumblings, even within the family, right? My, uh, my aunt, I remember one time just destroyed my mom about food stamps and we were like, we don't have any money. So it's like that or starve, right? And, and just thinking to myself, even as a kid, like that's embarrassing, but I get it. Right. And, and my hope is that people will find the willingness to understand like these, these services again are in place for a purpose. When, when looking at your journey, was it, was it your experiences with nonprofits that have led you down this place to be a service driven entrepreneur in the way that you are? I want to, as an entrepreneur, I, I, you know, the social part, I want to give back, you know, so for all the things that people have done for me in the past. There's been so many people that I, I can't remember. I can't, uh, you know, say thank you enough that have helped me to get where I am, that I want to be that for other people. I don't need to be recognized for it. I don't need an award. I just want to be able to, to put them on the same path that I did to get to reach my goal. So at the end of the day, it's always like, yeah, it's going to be, you know, you might have to put yourself in a spot where you're very uncomfortable. You are a little bit embarrassed. You're going to have people talking about you or whatever. I sit there and say, have, let that motivate you so that you sit there and, and get yourself out of that hole. Because for me, that's exactly what I needed to do. I needed to sit there and say, okay, yeah, all right. Yeah, I'm not, I don't have enough money. I don't have a nice car and all that stuff. So yeah, if I want the nice car, guess what? I'm going to have to make some more money. I'm going to make some better decisions. At the end of the day, it's going to come down to your opportunities and the decisions you make with each of those opportunities. So. I always tell people like, you have to be best prepared for it. And one of those ways is to make sure you, I know who you are. If you can get to the point where you don't care what other people think you're, you're winning the game. I mean, cause that, at the end of the day, that's one of the key things that I remember that I had to learn is just stop caring what other people think, stop comparing myself, because these are just things that will keep you from reaching your goals. 
That is such a great point, man. And and I, I hope people will sit with that because if 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 I cared, and I think you would probably agree and most people would, like if you really truly let other people's opinions make you act a certain way or think a certain way, like you're in trouble because most people, and look, and that can even people who have your best interest in mind, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes those are the most damaging people because they're like, oh, you should be happy or you should be satisfied or your life is fine. And it's like, but that thing that's inside of you that you feel this drive to grow, to be different, to be someone of value for you, not for other people, that can often get squelched in those conversations. So I think it's super important to recognize why you have to actually, and it's not to be mean, it's not to be crass, it's not even to throw people away, it's just to say, mm. I actually need this for me, not for you, and your opinion can't really play a role in the decisions I'm making about my life. And I think the more that people do that, the more success that they are going to have. So as as you grow, what what is your hope for just the way that people utilize nonprofits and and what nonprofits can and should be in the world? I say two things. If you're in a position to help a nonprofit, whether to donate, whether to just, you know inter make an introduction, sometimes it's just a matter of they need they need resources that they don't have. So if you're specialized in like I said, for me, it's uh, technology. Uh, so I created a nonprofit to help out those other nonprofits because, you know, there wasn't too many other nonprofits doing the same thing. But there are some that just need volunteers, you know, just show up at the food pantry, right? You have, you want to go buy a bag of groceries and drop it off at the food pantry? Guess what? That's going to go to another family that really can't afford that bag of groceries. And it's going to, it's going to help them out a lot. Um, so it's a matter of if you have the resources, you know, volunteer, give to, uh, to, to donate to nonprofits. And if you need the help, that's what it's there for. Go to those nonprofits, what, you know, and, and find, find them. You find those government programs that are out there to help you, to provide you assistance. So at the end of the day, it's going to be come down to what your decisions are and the opportunities that you do with the opportunities that are presented to you. Okay. So for me, that's what I tell my kids. Like you're going to, your life is going to be full of decisions. Some you're going to look back on and be like, oh, that was a terrible decision. Some you're going to look back and be like, that was, that was the right, you know, that worked out that, you know, I, I didn't think that would work out, but it worked out, you know? And so each of those decisions are vastly important. Now, at the end of the day, we're going to sit there and say, okay, this nonprofit can provide me this help or this support and those kind of things. What do you do with that support? You get, you know, groceries. Now what? You know, what do you want to do getting, be getting groceries for the next two years? Or do you want to sit there and say, okay, I need to find a new skill. So let me find a nonprofit that's helping me learn typing and computer skills or, or learning how to do uh, bookkeeping or something like that. And then, you know, there's lots of resources online. People are trying to find side, side hustles all the time. You know, it's just a matter of what are you dealing with your time? Not saying you have to be all business all the time, but at the same time, make sure you using your time in a valuable way. Yeah. It sounds to me like there's probably a nonprofit for kind of everything, right? Is, is there, cause I want to simplify it for people. Is there like a catch-all website or a place where people can find this information or is it just kind of like you're at the whim of Google here? Um, no, I mean, you can go, you can go into, cause I mean, for the government, you have to register your nonprofit, right? So you can go to, um, I figure what the name of the branch is, but you can go to your county, your county office and ask for, hey, what, uh, what programs and what nonprofits are available that do this or provide support for this. And this way you can knock out two birds and one stone because they can tell you about government programs available and they can tell you about registered nonprofits that you know are 501c3 uh, certified. Um, the other part is Google, right? Because sometimes a lot of these nonprofits aren't just you know brick and mortar places like a food pantry or, or, or uh, say a church. Um, there are plenty of them that are online. You know, Billion Acts is a, a nonprofit platform that I really love because it helps uh, promote campaigns by other nonprofits. You know, so if you're a, a nonprofit and you want to create a profile and show all the things that impact you're making in the community, you can go to Billion Acts and, you know, 
share your share your events, share what your your services and, and share all the things that you're doing uh with other nonprofits and their audience. So it is kind of up uh, to Google, you know, what you're searching for, but at the same time, that's what Google is there for. You know, that's what these search engines are for. You can go online, look up what you need, and then just put in the word nonprofit or government program and go from there. Yeah. Absolutely. And and there are so many services, so many beautiful ways, not only that you can get support, but that you can go and be of support and be service-based, be community-driven and really impact even in your own neighborhood. You'll be shocked how often people in your own neighborhood can use just a little bit of help. And you may be one of those people who just need to say, hey, I need a little bit of help. James, my friend, this conversation has been incredible. Before I ask you my last question, can you please tell everyone where they can find you? Uh, they can usually find me on LinkedIn. Uh, so James Connor, and then if you were looking, if there's plenty of James Connors there, you can look up James Connor with Flexible Sites. Uh, Flexible Sites is a nonprofit, like I said, that helps out you know other nonprofits, startup founders, small businesses. Just because you know everybody needs a little help with their tech needs, without you know breaking the bank. Uh, but at the same time, I do a lot of different things. I'm working uh, as a developer, C fractional CTO. Uh, I'm just I'm there trying to provide the skills that I've, I've built up over the years and then help, uh, those that are less fortunate that can't afford to hire a developer for like $150 an hour or anything like that. So if they want to look me up, it's on LinkedIn or, you know, through the flexible sites website. Other than that, yeah, hopefully they'll find this podcast and then they can, they, you know, they'll reach out, they might reach out to you say, you know, and then you can refer them to me through my email. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll put all the links in the show notes for everyone to find you. Um, I love your work. I think what you're doing is incredible. Uh, and we definitely need more people in the nonprofits helping to create massive change in the world. My last question for you, my friend, what does it mean to you to be unbroken? For me, it means that I didn't give up, you know, uh, you know, I'm still I'm still going to be, I'm going to still have my faults. I'm not perfect. I made bad decisions, but at the same time I grew and I'm better for what I went through. You know, I always sit there and think, you know, what would, without that struggle, right? Michael, you probably said the same thing. You probably thought the same thing is who would I be if I didn't go through that? You know, if I didn't struggle like that and I got to, to the same spot, would I be as, as humble as I am today? Definitely not, you know, would I be, you know, traveling the world and identifying what I like and what I want to do with my life? Probably not. I wouldn't be helping people. I would be thinking, you know, how to make more money and do things and, 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 uh, you know, probably in, in the financial world. But at the end of the day, uh, I'm, I feel like I'm blessed. So one of the things I sit there and do is I'm want to be grateful, uh, you know, so live in the current, in the present time, uh, and then just be happy with what I got. And those people that are around you, I always sit there and say, make sure that just in case, make sure that you say something spontaneous. I love you. Hey, thanks for doing all that stuff. I know you go through a lot with me or, you know, there's a lot that you do for this company or a lot you do for, for my kids. I sit there and say, it's appreciated. You know, I probably don't say it enough, but I appreciate it. And that giving appreciation to other people for me, that makes me feel less unbroken. Yeah. Brilliantly said, my friend. Thank you so much for being here. Unbroken Nation, thank you so much for listening. Please like, subscribe, comment, share, tell a friend. And until next time, my friends, be unbroken. I'll see ya. Thank you so much, Michael. Hey, Unbroken Nation, we'll be right back to the show. But I wanted to let you know that you can grab a copy of my first book, Think Unbroken, Understanding and Overcoming Childhood Trauma, for free. If you go to book.thinkunbroken.com, you can download the PDF ebook version of the book and get everything that I know about the baseline of healing trauma for free downloaded to your email right now. Just go to book.thinkunbroken.com to download your copy of Think Unbroken, Understanding and Overcoming Childhood Trauma for a PDF for your phone. Again, that is book.thinkunbroken.com. Thank you so much for listening to Think Unbroken. Please share this episode with someone who could use it and help us move forward in our mission of ending generational trauma in our lifetime. And if you would, please take five seconds to pop on iTunes or Spotify 
hit that five star, leave a review. And you can also reach out to us on social at Michael Unbroken or at Think Unbroken. And of course, you can check out our YouTube channel at Think Unbroken. Thank you for being a part of Unbroken Nation, my friends. And until next time, be unbroken.